Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast, Redesigning Normal. I'm your host, Andrew Southern. And today, my guest is Robin Solonecki, VP of Operations at Royal Health Group. Robin, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Could you tell our audience a little bit about Royal Health Group and also about how you got into your role of VP Operations? Just right off the bat. Sure. So Royal Health Group, we have 12 nursing, skilled nursing facilities, 10 are in Massachusetts, two in Rhode Island. We also have an assisted living facility. We've been, Royal Health Group has um, been established since 1997. I came on board in 2001 as a nursing home administrator. My background is a registered nurse, but I came in as an administrator, worked in one of our facilities for several years, and also in our assisted living and was promoted to director of operations and vice president of operations back in 2008. Wow. Okay. So you've been in your role for, for 13 years now. Yes, yes. Yes. And has the practice expanded during that time? How big was it when you entered that role? Great question. When we, when I came on board, we had four facilities and we clearly grew. Most of our growth was in the last four years. We doubled in size and purchase some more facilities in our area. So in, in the last four years, we grew to 12 facilities. Wow. And have you ever built from the ground up a facility? Yeah, no, we purchased okay. facilities. So there were facilities that were for sale, small facilities, mm -hmm. and we just took them over. The assisted living that we have, we did that, we grew that from the bottom, but all the other facilities we purchased. So I, I, we're just going to end up going on a tangent already. If we were designing an assisted living facility today, it's probably very different than what it used to be. Like what's changing in the industry for folks? What are they looking for in the product? For assisted living, their amenities are, are key. We, our assisted living was back in 2008 and it was more of a boutique. It was small, quaint, and people really want the amenities now. You're seeing okay. assisted livings with swimming pools, concierge services. So even though assisted living is a social model where you don't have to have physicians, you don't have to have registered nurses all the time, that's what people are looking for. People are looking for, I think it's almost like in between home and the skilled nursing facility. Okay. That's where assisted living is. I see. Okay. And your, your market, as you mentioned, is, is New England. Yes. Yes. And having grown up in New England, I'm aware that there's a bunch of months that aren't so nice out. <laughs> in the winter no. time. So your no. facilities also need to be interesting during those months when folks yes. don't go outside. Yeah, I always, there's always a battle in, in my house. And I think for most of the leadership that the kids love the snow days, everybody loves snow days because they get to stay home. And we always panic for the snow days because we know that means staff are going to be challenged to get to work. Yeah. Yeah. We don't like those snow days. Got it. Okay. Let's back up a little bit. And I want to talk a little bit about COVID. If we rewind to February or March of, of 2020 in your role as the operator, when did you maybe, when did you first hear about COVID and put together this idea that potentially it was going to affect your facilities that you oversee? Yeah. So I, I should start by letting you know that in my role, I do oversee all of the facilities, policy procedures, operations. So back in, I, I remember going on vacation in November of 2019 and coming back and having a few emails from the local Department of Public Health saying, hey, there's this infection in China, we're watching it, but don't worry about it. So we at that point said, oh, let's start looking at it. But I think you probably remember years ago when the bird flu, they were talking about the bird flu and we ended up getting N95s, not a whole lot, but we were somewhat prepared and it never happened. Right. So I think a lot of people thought this was the same thing. It's not going to happen. So that was in November. And then we started hearing, we heard about Seattle, we started, okay, now we really have to get going. We get it. We have to figure out what's going on, put some policies and procedures in place. And then I remember it was February of 2020 when we had our first scare. We had a resident from one of our buildings go to the hospital and we got the call. They're testing them for COVID. And I, that's when the panic just set in. Oh, geez, w w what are we doing? We still did. There was no guidance because nobody really knew. Fortunately, that person was negative, And that's when they were sending all the results to CDC. Right. So it was probably five days before we knew that this person was negative because it took that long to get the results initially. Wow. So that was 
Yeah, yeah, it was a long time, sometimes even long. So during that month, that's when we said, all right, we, we need information. Mm -hmm. Still, nobody knew. Department of Public Health wasn't providing any guidance. So we went on the website and we went on CDC website and said, okay, let's, we have to learn. And what we found was that if you wear masks, you wear eye protection, gowns and gloves, there's a very low risk of trans transmission. So we, that's when we started purchasing. And I remember even back then, it was hard. I would call the administrators of the building almost every day and say, go to your local hardware store. We had people going all over the state, going into hardware stores, buying N95s, buying whatever they could because our suppliers didn't have them. When was this? And What's the time frame now? This was March. Okay. This was March, end of February, beginning of March. Got it. And so we were looking and just to give you an idea, when we can buy a surgical mask, they're about eight cents a piece. We couldn't get them for less than $3, right. but we were still looking. We were looking for the N95s, couldn't find them. We were just, we were doing whatever we could. And then gowns, the gowns were typically 30 cents. We were paying between eight and $10 a gown. And those were for disposable. So we just, that's that was our focus. We had what we call the war room. We had posters mm -hmm. all over the place, where we were ordering things, how we were getting them. And the eye protection, which I have to tell you, people were like, what are you guys doing? We were buying swimming goggles because you couldn't get the eye protection. So we had all this in place because our goal was to really protect the residents and our right. staff. So we put that in place and we put the mask and the goggles in place before it was even required. And I remember getting a phone call from another facility, a competitor saying, what are you doing? You're making your staff wear masks and our staff are mad. And I, I said, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but we need to protect them. We need to do what we can. And we had these weekly DPH calls and somebody on the call actually asked the Department of Public Health to tell facilities who were requiring their staff to wear masks to stop because they couldn't get them as well and they were challenged and they just, their staff were upset that we were requiring masks and they couldn't get the mask. So it was, we never obviously got that directive, but we were really enforcing the mask and the eye protection before it was even a, a regulation. The other thing uh, we did was visitation. We we realized that we got to stop letting people come in the building. So we stopped visitation. We got calls from the regulators saying, you can't do that. It's a resident. We're like, but we're trying to protect the residents. Mm -hmm. Probably about three weeks later, they came out with, you need to stop visitation. I'm not trying to get praised for the fact that we were ahead of it, but I will share that it was very trying times when you sit in a room with your team saying, okay, what, how can we protect our, our residents and our staff? What can we do? And this is what we did. And we were getting some backlash in the background saying, you can't do that. You can't do that. And in the end, we were able to do that. Did it make a big difference in the beginning? Partly no, because there were still so many unknowns about this. Testing was a huge issue in the beginning. We couldn't get our residents or staff tested. And again, I, I just think people didn't know when I, I talk about CDC, CMS, DPH. When we did first in March, it was March 20th that we had our mm -hmm. first case. And I, I remember us calling the state to say we need testing because they were coordinating the testing. And they said, do you have anybody with symptoms? And we said, no, but we have a positive case. We're not testing unless they have symptoms. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Now, months later, we find out that asymptomatic people can transmit. So you had in all these facilities, all these nursing facilities, people living together in the same room, activities, dining, that had no symptoms, but we're carrying the infection and spreading it. So there was a lot of unknowns in the beginning, but we once we were able to get testing, and it took several months for us to be able to actually test asymptomatic staff and residents, that's when you started seeing the, the cases go down. Now, I'm just gonna back up. How many, across all of the facilities, how many um, residents do you have and how many staff do you have? Just so I understand the scope of what who sure. you're testing and who you're sure. overseeing. At, at the time when COVID, pre-COVID, we were running about 1,200 residents 
in approximately a thousand mm-hmm. staff members. Okay. Post COVID, because nobody wants to go into a nursing home after COVID, they were really nervous. We are at approximately 900 residents and right now. And those other, those residents that they went to families' homes or something, is, is that what people will do when they get scared and they move out? They, we really didn't have anybody move out. Apologize for that. We really didn't have anybody move out, but people that were in the hospital didn't, they went home instead of going to nursing homes. So people weren't, and the other thing is there weren't elective surgeries. So a lot of the hospitals weren't doing electives. People were afraid to go to the hospital. So then you weren't really seeing the admissions in the nursing homes. So for, first of all, this February, 2020 is about the earliest that I've heard any of my guests talk about it. Most yes. front facing yes. businesses were seeing it. I think people t- talk about March 11th or March 12th, whenever the NBA announced that they weren't going to have their season yeah. for a lot of folks, restaurants and stuff like that. They're like, oh, yeah. wow, this is serious. Yeah. But February is earlier. Yeah. You guys were already yeah. on it, seeing, seeing what was yeah. coming, w- worried that somebody might have it, even though at that point, what was it? You said it was in Seattle, right? At, at that point, like there was like some, right. something happening right. um, yeah. out West, but potentially it's yeah. with you guys in New England. So you took all the yeah. appropriate measures yeah. to test that person. So when the state finally was able to get you testing, was that, is that a machine or what is that that you actually get? It was still a slow process. And what happened was they would have the National Guard. So they recruited the National Guard who came in and tested all of our residents. And it was an ordeal. They came in their full gear and went through and they would test all our residents, but we were still not getting the results right away. So it was still taking a good four to five days to get the results. So you have a building where you might have one or two residents that are positive and they come in and we're still waiting for four or five days to get the results. That was in the beginning. And then slowly as more, we couldn't even get swabs to, to do flu swabs, never mind the COVID swabs, because that's how you test, you put the, sure. you have the swab in the nares. And I would probably, I want to say, come summertime, pre, you know, just about the summertime, that's when they became more available and then they allowed other vendors to come and test. So then we coordinated with other vendors and we started seeing a 36 hour turnaround, which was better. And now we're to the point where it's a 24 hour turnaround, which is really great. So if we have anybody that we suspect, we test and we're going to know within 24 hours. Is that a PCR or a rapid? So that's PCR, but also what's come up. Yeah. With the PCR and that goes to the state lab, but it's very quick. But also what they've been allowing is the rapid test, the Binex now test. They have seen that that is 95% accurate in in the compared to the PCR test. So in the beginning, okay. we had to do both. We would test with a Binax and then we had to confirm with a PCR. We never saw any contraindications with those tests. Like Got they it. were always accurate. And then, so now what they say is we can use the Binax for mm-hmm. surveillance testing, but once a week, we still have to test unvaccinated staff with a PCR. Oh, okay. We got to get into that <laughs> also, uh, if we can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me yeah. just make a quick note of that. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. So now we're in what, spring, summertime, and there's, yeah. you understand maybe the scope of what's going on a bit better. In fact, in the summer, there was a bit of a, yeah. a lull in cases. And oh. at that point, did you implement anything in your, I'm sure you did, in your facilities beyond limited or restricted visitation? What was it, like temperature checks or did you do air filtering? What did you do in order to try and keep folks in place as safe as you could? Yep. Yeah, great question. So some of the, we did the screening that was required, but we definitely did that. We also, we went a step further with our staff. They weren't happy, but we had to, that we, anybody that went on vacation, if they traveled anywhere, they had to do a 14 day quarantine at home because Mm -hmm. we still didn't know what was going on. So that was challenging for us with some of our staff. And keep in mind too, now we're dealing with children that weren't in school and that was a, a struggle as well. But that was, the screening was really important, monitoring for infections, but we also invested in the filtration. So we got, 
we got filtration for our HVAC systems, but we also got machines that would filter the air and they're the size of a refrigerator and they just, they cycle, recycle the air. So we had those in any of our buildings that didn't have central air, we purchased those. We also purchased the, their sanitizing guns, sprays, and they wrap around everything. So if you have a doorknob, for example, or a handrail, you, you can clean that, you wipe and clean, but this actually wraps around it. So we were able to purchase those and that was is that, part of our By the way, is that something cleaning. that you still do? Wow. And, and right, yes. so that's like a, yes. that's a daily cleaning. Yeah. And then I imagine at night people are rubbing down, like actually wiping down everything. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, high what touch. they call okay. high touch areas, um, we still do that. Food yeah. service, yeah. Yeah. did that change? Food, so, yes, so we, unfortunately, it was very hard for our residents because we had to cancel all activities, all dining rooms, mm -hmm. so everybody was eating in their rooms. So the socialization was really challenging for our residents. As far as the presentation, that was the fine. We're still using regular plates, regular silverware, but they were delivered to their rooms for all their meals. And that just got lifted. I want to say we were still doing that in the summer. It was only this spring wow. that they finally lifted that residents wow. could go. Okay, to so we go into, if you look at the graphs on the, you know, on New York Times or something, Christmas, it, it's yeah. just like a crazy peak that is, is unlike anything else. And then it falls back off again. And then now we're in a, a slower decline. During that holiday season, which is already probably, that's when everyone wants to visit. And that's when everyone wants to do these things and everyone, your staff wants to travel yeah. and all that. And that was during like the biggest yeah. peak of this whole thing and you can see it in real time. What was that period like? It, it was sad. It really was hard for families not to be able to really take their loved ones home and spend a lot of time with them. We could do outdoor visits, but you can't, at the time we could do outdoor visits aren't really great in the winter time. So that was a challenge. We did window visits, we did video visits, but it really was, it, it was hard for our residents. And yes, for our staff as well, that they couldn't mm -hmm. go away. We had a lot of people that used to go to Florida and take these vacations and we just, we couldn't allow it. It was, it was trying times and we've almost been a year into this and people just want to be done. And I think that was in the summertime, we started to see it slow down, even though they kept saying, we're going to see it in the fall. We're going to see it in the fall. Things were slowing mm -hmm. down. And I think people had false hope that they, we'd get back together. Things would be back to normal. And then yeah, it hit us. And I think it was almost worse than it was in the beginning sure. because you had fatigue in addition to having to. And that, that's already a period of being hunkered down in the New England region. And now you've got this. Yeah. Yeah. other yeah. threat which yeah. is raging all around you and maybe it's in yeah. with you and you can't really tell yeah. i can yeah. imagine that's a very difficult time probably yeah. the maybe one of the most difficult yeah. periods during this whole pandemic was that sort of dark winter and yeah you Absolutely. mentioned something about window visits is this literally what i think it is where you would come and visit grandpa and and you yeah. be in the window and maybe call yeah. so that you can hear yeah. you and talk through the window yeah, I talked to the window and, it, and we couldn't have the screens open because then there was a risk that they would spread infection. So the windows would be closed and the resident would be on one side and the family member on, on the and other side. people are like walking around that's bushes exactly to get to was. that particular window. Wow. Wow. Uh, that's a scene yeah, that yeah, we'll hope to never yeah. have to see again. Okay. Absolutely. So then va vaccines are gonna basically I don't remember exactly when it was but we all got news that it works and it's been emergency approved and the first yep. folks to get it are people yep. essentially that live in your facilities and that work in your facilities and then we're gonna get it out to everybody else yep. so I would imagine that you all saw it first Pfizer yep. Moderna or something like that in January is that right oh okay December our first our first facility was December 28th that had the vaccine. We were, I, I'll always remember that day. I, I went there to support everybody. It was a great day. So that started December 28th. And then again, the state was coordinating that. So it's, it was a challenge to get, there's over 350 facilities in Massachusetts and then with Rhode Island but it started in December. We got the Pfizer, so they gave the Pfizer in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and the Moderna in, in Rhode Island. And what a huge difference. I, we have seen it. And in the beginning, 
we did see a couple of times where the first building had it again December 28th then we had a few positive cases and we were a little nervous oh geez this isn't working mm -hmm. but let's remember they say it's 95 percent effective and the, it was just their first dose and it was within two weeks of that first dose so probably something was going on now we we are very fortunate we haven't had any resident cases we occasionally have staff cases. We haven't had a staff case in the last two weeks, which is big. And in the state of Massachusetts, in this past week, only mm -hmm. 11 facilities saw cases and okay. most of them were staff. Find Vaccines that work. The, the, there's two different populations that you need to convince to take this. You need to convince your patients and residents and you need to convince your yeah. staff. Yes. Did you find that percentage yeah. of folks that were convinced to take yeah. it were about the same in both populations or? What did you see? No, no, residents were, we, Okay. we only had a handful of residents that didn't want to take it. Most of our residents jumped at the chance. Their family members did, they, for them. So we have, I would say most of our facilities have a 90 to 95% of our residents were, were vaccinated. I'm in a building today and we were looking at those numbers just to see where we're at. And out of 84 residents, only two declined it. So those mm -hmm. are good numbers. Staff, more challenging. The staff, a lot of them, it's a cult. They didn't want it. They are nervous because it's new and people are thinking they just created this. We don't know what's going to happen. A lot of the females are nervous about in the future if they have children. So there's a lot of unknowns and I, 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 I try to respect that, but I also see that it works. So we really try to just educate our staff. We have mm -hmm. on average 65% compliance with staff vaccination. My goal is to get that at least to 80 because I really feel that the more staff that we get vaccinated, the we're Yeah, really there's probably some sort of curve, which, which was always spoken about as herd immunity, yeah. but on yeah. a much smaller level, if you can get to 80%, then yeah. even those, the 20% that didn't get it are like, unable to spread. I've noticed some cultural hesitation yeah. as well yeah. from different groups, but I've also noticed that as more yeah. folks in that group get vaccinated and they hear about somebody else getting vaccinated, it becomes a little bit more acceptable. Okay, maybe I'll get it. So just that, yeah. that plenty of people yeah. were signed up to yeah. get it as soon as they could. I'm included. I come from a family of medical yeah. professionals and just yeah. don't have a lot of distrust for medical the medical world in general but I, I i totally get that some people do but i think that now it's probably a bit more about convincing yeah. those holdouts so there's some folks that you'll never convince but if you can convince the holdouts to, that this is safe and that it will benefit yeah. them and their loved ones they'll do it because they're yeah yeah and that's what you do you really focus on them because that's what we needed to do. And we did in the very beginning, there was no, a lot of denials or refu refusals, mm -hmm. but then after they saw that we were all okay, that nothing happened to us, we're here, then that's where we started seeing a few more people agree to do it. So they saw that, that we were okay. And when you, when we think about, I told you how many people we have within our company and including residents and staff, honestly, if we had 20 people that had symptoms or side mm -hmm. effects after the vaccine, that's a high number. We had a couple of people that had flu-like symptoms for a couple of days. That was really it. One person had a rash on their arm. We really were very successful and wow. didn't have a lot of side now, effects. Is there, so, you know, this is great. just thinking out loud. Yeah. Is there a, a time when yeah. a medical facility of any kind has to say, hey, staff, you know, you need to get a vaccine in order to be front facing with the patients. It's just too risky. Or is that something that like, you can, that's a third rail that you can't yeah. touch? Okay. I, I would love to be able to do that. One of the, one of the things that happened in this past year, not just with healthcare, but in general is the labor force. We are struggling with staff. We lost some staff just because the trauma that they went through during COVID and taking care of the residents and seeing residents pass away, but also, mm -hmm. um, Unemployment has hurt us. The in Massachusetts, they're getting their unemployment plus three hundred dollars, so people are anxious to get back to work, or they're getting out of health care. So it's very as much as we in the beginning we said we're putting our foot down. If you don't get vaccinated, you cannot work. We would lose thirty five percent of our staff, and we can't afford to do it right now. So yeah, as much as I would love to do it, 
you know, we can't, and we can't mandate our residents as well. So we have that. But one of the things we've talked about is similar to the flu. We have some staff that in the past would refuse the flu vaccine, mm -hmm. whether for medical or religious, and they had to wear a mask. So from October to April, if they don't get the flu vaccine, they have to wear a mask. Right now, we're still wearing masks. I'm in an office with my door closed so I can have my mask off, but when I'm out there, I have to have a mask on at all times. If they ever take that away, if they start telling us we don't have to wear masks if we're vaccinated, then that's that will be one thing that we would do for our unvaccinated staff is have them wear masks. It's to protect mm -hmm. the other uh, workers and the residents, but also sure, hopefully an incentive for them to okay, get so the Okay, so what do you think, and now let's say, yeah. hopefully, we're, this is the beginning of, of June, hopefully we're at the end of this with the vaccines, the rates are going down. I'm sure that your uh, facilities mm -hmm. are feeling a lot more secure at the moment. What are some lessons learned? What are some things, first of all, that you've implemented, you, you, you mentioned you were doing the air filtration or the high touch area of sanitation. The, will those things continue? They will. Uh, we definitely will keep those systems in place. We also really looking at visitation and looking at the, the buildings. We have to always protect resident rights and this is their home, but we also want to manage when people are coming in. So we look at that. Now we're allowed to have visitors. If they're fully vaccinated, they can come and visit but there has to be some controls over that. Not that we're gonna be in lockdown, but we're going to really manage that more closely. And then the visitation, where the visitation is going to occur. Outside visits, we, we purchase these beautiful outdoor tents, almost like the ones that you see in weddings. So we have those in all our buildings and we really wanna encourage those type of visits more than the others. In screening people, we still need to screen the residents and the staff that they, when they come in, just sure. to make sure there's no, there's, you know, no risk of COVID. If um, and if there's any doubt, then we, we quarantine them. Staff member whose vaccine card is on file, they're, if they're still wearing a mask because they have to, but once that's no yeah. longer, they wouldn't have to wear a mask. That, that person doesn't, isn't yeah. a high risk person. Do that, does that person, when they arrive at, at work, have to have their temperature taken still, or can they bypass the all of that? Because there's still a risk for somebody to be positive, okay. even though they're vaccinated, we'll still screen. We're still going to have to screen. And we keep in mind December, again, December 28th was the first time we were started our vaccinations. Yeah. We don't know. We're still waiting to find out about the booster shot, or are we going to have to get vaccinated again in December? So we're still gonna have those precautions. We're still gonna have to screen people and make sure that there's no infections. No, if they have a cold, if they have the sniffles, we have to send them home. We have to test them and then send them home until we get the results, which is challenging now because if you go outside, you're gonna see all the pollen out there. So now you're challenged with, but I always have right, allergies. Right. We know, but we gotta test you, we gotta send you <sighs> okay, home. Okay, so, so have you had a chance to think about it sounds like you you responded to the news coming at you quickly and efficiently. And now, does it make sense to have some sort of playbook actually written out for any potential future event? I think it's a preparedness yeah. exercise. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's definitely is. And we have a fully stocked warehouse with PPE and we're keeping that up. Even though we don't need as much as of it now, we're still purchasing to make sure we have, at le our goal is to have at least 90 day supply for all of our buildings. We have more than that now. We have, for gowns, I think we have a year's worth of gowns. For surgical masks, we have six months. The N95s we're still purchasing. And so our goal is to have at least 90 days. I, I think the biggest lesson, it was, it was the testing. I think the key here is testing in isolation. And we know, we learned as CDC, CMS, and DPH learned, but I think seeing what this horrific infection did to, to the buildings, we're not going to wait for the guidance. We get an indication that there's an infection like this right. out there. We're going to put those protocols in place, similar to what we did 
before they became regulation, we're always going to protect our residents and staff first and deal with the aftermath of getting yelled at by our regulators down, down the road. But we do have an infection control program. Got it. And it will yeah, address Yeah, just to come full circle. In addition you to have, COVID, as you described, that. from your peers, basically, from your competitors who couldn't get their hands on PPE and therefore figured the best yeah. solution was to make it yeah. so that you couldn't use PPE, which yeah. in retrospect sounds ridiculous. And regulators right. who are telling you you can't do this or that because yeah. of a set yeah. of, of rights for the residents, which are important to, as you said, are yeah. important to protect, but we're in an emergency. Yeah. And yeah. you guys sounded like you went it alone because it was the right thing to do. And that's right. been right. clearly proven out by time and experience. Yeah. Yeah. So is that a story? We're telling it now on the podcast. Yeah. Is that yeah. something that you can talk to your families about and say, yeah. look, we did this thing. Yeah. We were actually rubbing up against regulators, but we knew it was the right thing to do. Is that actually a story to tell folks in the future that you're particularly well prepared for this sort of thing? Yeah, I think the one thing that we've done all along is communicate with our families. So we have a website that when, I get to tell you, in once the Department of Public Health and CMS got involved, and it, it was a slow start because they didn't know, um, Right. The communication was every week, every day. Policies were changing. There's still sometimes where we get one policy and next week we get another one. But we would update our families all the time. And we have a system, it's called text -em -all, where we would send updates to our families and let them know that there's something on the website or if they have any cases, mm -hmm. let them know about visitation. It's nice because it's two-way conversation. So that way, if they had a question, they could just text us back and we can get back to them. So. I do feel that we have great communication with our families, and I do feel that majority of them really understood what we were, what was going I, on in the buildings, along with everyone and else, knew that, that we this were doing a everything a we possibly event, could. Which we will take our lessons, move forward, and of course, you'll be prepared. You said yourself you have 90 or yeah. plus days of PPE, which yeah. is really a first line thing. You could put that into place in a day. Yeah. Go, run to the warehouse, grab everything out put yeah. everyone back into gowns if there was a yeah. COVID-23 or something. Yeah. I doubt, I'm going to go out on a limb here, I doubt that you would get yeah. the same criticism from your peer group again on that decision because it was the correct decision and that person was a little foolish to correct. do. Yeah. And I do, they, they might not have had the resources that we had. I remember sitting there and saying, I can't believe we're paying $4 for an N95, or I can't believe we're going to pay $10 for a disposable gown when they're only 38 cents. And I remember, again, I, mm -hmm. I call it the war room. We sat there and the owner of the company said, I don't care. Do what you need to do. Buy what you need to do. We'll take care of it afterwards. We need to protect our residents and our staff. And did we have this? Is, we're not making a lot of money. It's not we're a rich company, but he knew that we had to take care of our mm -hmm. residents and our staff. And I think some of the other companies didn't see that. Like they just, they were just dealing with the now and there was no way they were going to pay $30,000 for, for a case of, sure. of mask. And that's, that was their challenge is that they couldn't see it. And in the end, we all realized it's, just, it's it an incredible right story. I am in, I'm impressed with how early you were able to respond to this. Yes. As I said, this is about as early as anyone I've inter interviewed for this podcast series to yeah. see it coming even earlier than 2020 yeah. and then yeah. see something that recognize that you recognize as potentially COVID yeah. in February yeah. and immediately go at the time when there was very little testing, go directly to the government and yeah. say, we may have a case. It may be a different sort of pneumonia, but we've got something here yeah. that looks very similar to what you're describing. Amazing. Very scary yeah. time. Yeah. 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 It's scary. And I, in my hope is that the CDC, and we all hear the stories that even in Massachusetts, we, Massachusetts got hit quickly. They were one of the first states other than Seattle because of the Biogen. Yeah. So that was the issue yeah. where they had the big conference mm -hmm. and a couple of people were sitting. Remember, that's, that was, that's in our backyard. So they had a couple of people that were sick. 
they tried to reach sure. out and nobody got back to them. And these people were going to the casino, they were going, they stayed at the Marriott, they were all over Massachusetts. Nobody understood, even the epidemiologist and the state government, the public health. So I think they learned a lot as well. And they now know because as nursing home providers, the, right. the Department of Public Health and CMS, they're our go-tos. They're our regulators. They're the ones that provide guidance. And in the beginning, we waited for that guidance. And then when we realized we weren't getting it, that's when we said, all right, we got to do something because I, we can't wait. And so my, I hope that they see that and, and they know better and they're going to make sure that they are on alert quicker, sooner, and they provide us that information. What was that decision-making process still, like? The, was that you know, on, we're be on you and, and your team? And or how did you guys decide we're going to do do this even though we're not we're getting nothing out of the CDC. Let's do this ourselves. You mentioned was it the CEO was saying just buy the PPE and Yeah. Again, I was just we were sitting there and we're small. Mm -hmm. We have 12 facilities, but as far as the leadership, there's the owner, there's me and I we mm -hmm. have a VP of clinical operations. The three of us sat in that room and we had a couple of our regional nurses and that's when we were on, I, I remember it was like one o'clock in the morning and I'm reading CDC and I'm looking and I'm like, oh wait, low risk. This means our, our staff will be protected. I went into work the next day and said, this is what we need to do. And that's right. when he said, all right, as the owner of the company, he was out going to the hardware stores looking for masks. It was, it really, we were all over the place trying to find that. It was an ordeal. And the swimwear goggles and you can laugh a little bit now because i think right, like the pictures blue, that blue you know tinted we goggles people, with a mat with a we were really wearing colorful swimwear goggles oh yes they were all different colors yeah. we got them from i think it's sns worldwide one of those vendors and we had all these goggles and i remember one time i went into one of the buildings and they said to me we thought you were crazy when we got all this information, we thought you were crazy. And I get emotional about this, but then they said, we now know what you were doing and thank you. Because they were, we were just throwing this stuff at them saying, you gotta wear this. And like, what do you mean we gotta wear this? And the gowns, I remember mm -hmm. the other pieces, we, at first we couldn't get gowns. We were wearing disposable raincoats. We got from China, no less, we, we ordered about 30,000 disposable raincoats and that's what our staff were wearing to protect themselves and then when those wore out we actually found a restaurant vendor yeah sure that yeah. had a thousand meat coats those meat coats we bought those because we still in the beginning we couldn't even get the gowns so we bought those and we were using those as gowns because he said the restaurants were closing he had those so we actually were using those and raincoats in the beginning again right because they're wearing like whatever a, a, we can a get for our staff and that's and why, a respirator you know, from ace really and, 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 and blue <laughs> swim goggles and they realized. wow yeah so we are more prepared we have plenty of gowns we have plenty of masks we have the n95s eye protection we've been able to purchase appropriate eye protection now so you know we are in a better position and i think yeah just we're not going to wait we're just the minute something comes up we're going to take action and we hope that the the again cd cdc cms they the testing was key that's the other piece because I do feel with everything we had, it didn't matter because we didn't know who was positive, who mm -hmm. was negative. So as long as on their end, they can make sure that they're reacting quickly and can get test results to the buildings quickly, that's going to be key. Sure. Because again, I told you in the beginning, it was five, seven days. Now we know within 24 hours. So we test somebody. If, if they have a runny nose, we're testing them, sending wow. them home until we get well, the results. Well, Robin, it's so a tremendous it's testing story. And isolation, I super isolating I appreciate really it so much that you shared it with our audience because I think it's just a tremendous, <laughs> all these different events, there's actually some funny stuff in there and some really scary stuff in there. And then some, what sounds to me, triumphant yeah. stuff where you guys really did the yeah. right thing yeah. at the right times. Yeah. So I want to thank you again for being a guest on yeah. the podcast, Robin. Thank you so much. Okay, have a good day.